Well, good morning. This is Friday, February 12th, and there's a dog barking outside, um, and we're taking up robocalls, and it happens to be my dog, and he is being what we refer to as a jack wagon. So I'm going to let Senator uh, Baruth introduce David Hall, and I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Hall needs no introduction. The, il the illustrious David Hall. Um, David, are you going to walk us through, or is that what you're doing this morning? Uh, it's a fair question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, that's up to you, actually, Senator. Sorry? I think that's up to you. All right. Well, um, I think that might not be a bad idea since it's a two-page bill. Um, right. So let's start there. Sure. Um, well, good morning, David Hall, Legislative Council. Uh, it's nice to virtually be with you all, see you all, miss you in real person, in real life. Is that what they call it, in real life? I'll, I'll see you soon. But um, until then, you'll have to suffer another morning of uh, a Zoom walkthrough. And this is S11. It's an act relating, uh, what do we call it? An act relating to prohibiting robocalls. Um, it is a two-page bill. There's, there's a lot more going on uh, beneath the surface in the world of robocalls than this bill would suggest. So before I turn to the text, um, let me just remind you that you all took this, a, a similar bill up to this uh, about a year ago. It was S324. The only difference between this and that was that this committee reduced uh, ultimately the criminal fine from $10,000 to $1,000 per call. But otherwise, you've seen this before. And um, so you may remember the construct here is to try to just mirror federal law for purposes of state law. And so that's why I want to say that there's more going on uh, beneath the surface because there's a lot happening at the federal level in this issue. You may remember from our hearing last year on this subject that the federal government adopted the TRACED Act in uh, December 30th of 2019. And so in the intervening uh, year plus, um, the FCC, the FTC providers, lots of people have been having lots of meetings to try to adopt um, some orders and make some more recommendations on what telecom providers and the government can do to try to reduce the number of robocalls that people are receiving. Part of that is called uh, the shake and stir technology, which, you know, for the biggest providers is supposed to provide sort of a digital footprint and map and verification process so that you can make sure or that most of the calls or more of the calls that are coming through are from legitimate folks. Because right now, most of the robocalls in particular are not from legitimate sources and they're from all over the world and um, it's a problem. Everybody recognizes it. Um, so what is the state bill, what would the state law do under this bill? Um, as I said, the purpose really in section one, uh, you know what, I'm not sharing my screen, perhaps I should pull that up. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. All right. Now you should be looking at uh, the bill as introduced. So in section one here, we're in Title IX, you know, roughly in the area of the consumer protection laws. And this would create this new state law statute that basically says you can't initiate a telephone call to a Vermont consumer using automatic telephone dialing or an artificial pre recorded voice in violation of these two governing federal laws. So those terms, automatic telephone dialing system and artificial pre-recorded voice, those are defined in these federal laws. People know what they mean. And um, the two applicable federal statutes are basically what's known as the TCPA and the TCFAPA. So that's the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, 47 USC, 227, and then the Telemarketing Consumer Fraud and Abuse Prevention Act. And 
those also have a suite of regulations that have been adopted to implement those. So as a general premise, bear that in mind. If this law passes, the state law is coextensive with whatever is in the federal law. Obviously, we want to know what the federal law does. And to do that, I'm actually going to pull up another screen. I found a couple of things helpful here. Are you seeing this FTC page? Yep. Great. So this is this is a pretty straightforward and simple uh, summary of what's going on in the world. This is on the Federal Trade Commission's website. Um, so basically, the, the those federal laws ban calls to either cell phones or landlines using those automatic uh, dialing systems or the pre-recorded voices with a few exceptions. And so that's sort of the scope uh, of what I want you to see here. This says most you know, of them are illegal and um, they're mostly scams, but there are, you'll see here on the page, there are a few classes of things that are permitted uh, under the federal law. And I know that some of you have, in the past have raised questions about what about nonprofits or political uh, organizations, et cetera. So, uh, you know, school reminders, calls from your pharmacy, those types of things you'll see here are okay. So first class messages that are purely, the, let me just rephrase. These are the exceptions from the general rule that you can't make unsolicited robocalls. So you can do messages that are purely informational. So flight being canceled, appointment reminders, delayed school, et cetera. You, those can come through as long as they're not also trying to sell you something in the scope of that call. Um, you know, the next bullet is debt collection calls. And this is for business contacting you to collect a debt. Um, that's okay. They can't also try to sell you debt services while they make that call. I'll pause here to say that the TCPA in its statutory language carved out an exception um, for calls related to the collection of government debt. And the Supreme Court last year actually struck that down saying that that privileged one kind of speech over another and was not okay, but they found it to be severable. So we don't have to worry about that, but know that that case was out there and that um, collection of US government debt no longer gets uh, you know, priority treatment under the statute. Um, you can still make political calls. You can make calls from some healthcare providers such as your pharmacy. And you can- Can they be robo political calls? I'm sorry? Can they be re pre-recorded political calls? Yes, yes. Why yes. is that? That's in the federal law. <laughs> An obvious carve out. Can we, can we ban it? Uh, well, I mean, you could. It's probably unconstitutional. Well, doesn't seem to stop them in Washington if it's unconstitutional. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, you know, I personally, I think it costs you more votes than it gains you when it's a robocall from a candidate. Um, but sure. um, so I, I just absolutely refused to do it. But during the last campaign, one of our opponents was a strong user of robocalls. Mm -hmm. And it was some of the some of the comments on the robocall were um, using our names, and um, you know mine or Senator Campion's or opponents, and I thought that was illegal without notifying us. And I that found, is yeah. And here's what the problem is: there is no real enforcement mechanism. I think the Government yeah. Operations Committee should look at that because I made a complaint about. Um, uh, one of my opponents in the mass media mailing, which used us in his mass media, and he never notified anybody, never did anything. And, and it's basically swept under the rug and there's no consequences whatsoever. So I hope government operations will look at both of those issues where they use an opponent's name or in either mass mailing or in robocalls or in advertising. And, um, there ought to be some consequences for doing that besides just please don't do it again. A little slap on the wrist. 
Dick, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, David, if political calls are accepted from the feds, we would not be able to do that here, would we, without running afoul of the federal statute? Uh, it's not really a, a, a conflict, a preemption issue so much as a free speech issue. Um, so the, the, the way that these laws are constructed at the federal level, um, you know, they have their regulatory framework, but they also specifically provide a few things. One, private citizens can enforce their rights under those federal laws. State attorney generals can enforce the rights on behalf of citizens under those laws. And, um, and that's, you know, so that scheme is sort of freestanding. And then the last piece is that those laws also say that uh, a state law could be, is not preempted. It could be more protective. But then we run into, where, where we run into the issue here is that most of these, most of the prohibitions are trying to uh, stop basically commercial speech and that has a lower you know constitutional threshold for how it can be regulated once you start talking about trying to ban a political call for instance then you get into speaker based content based restrictions that <laughs> start choosing one class of content based speech over another which is where you run into first amendment problems and if it's content speaker based speech like as they uh, discussed in the exemption for uh, collection of US government debt, then it's a strict scrutiny standard and usually you lose on that. So, I mean, to answer your question, you, you know, it's not really a problem with the conflict necessarily between what we did at the state uh, in the fed versus the federal law. It's really a, a free speech issue. Well, what, I guess what I'm, I'm suggesting is that I understand that, and I understand the free speech issue, and that political robocalls are allowed, but that we have certain laws, particularly the 45-day rule, and um, while it, there is no consequence for violating it, as far as I can see, that, you know, it, it happens in, um, you know, late October, the event, um, we get a half, excuse me, half-hearted apology in the, you know, sometime in late December. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's the only consequence. The person admits they made a mistake and, um, on they go. Um, so the, our campaign finance laws, I don't believe have any consequences for violating these robocall or mass media, um, events. I, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the campaign finance laws, to be honest, to tell you. And, you know, it, I guess it is possible that um, in that context, you could try to put some reasonable time plan or measure, time manner place restrictions on, for instance, you know, the hours during which um, something uh, calls could come through. Those are okay. It's when you start trying to ban, you know, either whole classes or particularly one class but not another, where you really get into the the viewpoint or the the, the speaker content based type stuff. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, there's no protection for there's no First Amendment protection for illegal speech. What you know, what it's sort of considered low value speech, and um, you know, you could try to make the argument that if somebody is lying or trying to deceive people, then that kicks us over to uh, a kind of a different area. But yeah, I, I, I don't want to step too far in the mud, but, you know, whether or not somebody's being truthful on a political ad is, that's kind of tough to... No, I wasn't talking about being truthful. I was, following, I, I was talking about following the laws that we already have regarding the 45-day notice. Sure. And when they fail to do that, fail to follow that law, there's no consequence. That's what I was referring to. Sure. Um, let me let me share uh, the bill again, and let's see. So here are the other pieces of it. So if we're going to track 
uh, you know, what's in the federal law and these two consumer protection statutes, okay, what does it mean at the state level? Well, this, if this were adopted, it would create, you know, a state level offense. It could be prosecuted in state court, uh, you know, by the AG's office or state's attorney. I mean, that, again, that can already happen under the federal statutes. The AG could try to enforce the federal provisions in federal court, and they have exclusive jurisdiction under that. So maybe this is more nimble. Maybe there's, you know, a state law action you could add to a federal complaint, or you could pursue it at the state level independently. This would create a, a civil violation first of the Consumer Protection Act, 9 VSA 2453. Uh, it provides that each prohibited call is a separate violation. And three here, a person who gets a call in violation of the section could bring an action in superior court. You go for damages or a civil penalty, injunctive relief, punitive damages, and attorney's costs and fees. Um, and then the award could be the greater of actual damages or a civil penalty, 500 first, 1,000 subsequent. Um, this would also create a criminal penalty. So a person who violates a section could be 90 days imprisonment or a $1,000 fine per violation or both. And again, each telephone call constitutes a separate violation. And then under D here, this is all, was also present in S324. Under D, the AG's office should exercise its authority and discretion to work cooperatively with other state and federal government entities to identify callers who initiate robocalls to consumers in violation of the section. So that's what the bill does. Are there, uh, oops, are there questions? Yeah, you're bringing up a horrible memory from law school. <laughs> um, the last section, the criminal part, I recall a, a question somewhere that <clears throat> if a person standing on the east bank of the Connecticut River fired a gun and struck and killed somebody on the west side of the Connecticut River, in which state could they be charged with murder? And this, this bill sort of brings up the same thing. If I'm in New Hampshire and I make a call into Vermont, am I violating the law if, if New Hampshire does not have a similar statute. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really interesting um, area of law, the choice of law, the choice of forum. Um, this came up uh, years ago. You may remember when you all were working on legislation relating to uh, rent-a-centers, you know, places like errands where um, people could do <clears throat> renting material, and there were locations both in Vermont and New Hampshire, some in New York. There were advertisements in Vermont, also toward, to New Hampshire. We had certain requirements for what they had to include in advertisements, where they could dis have they have to display prices, um, that type of stuff. And the, the, the very same kind of issues come up with, well, what do we, you know, how, how far does this extend? I mean, there are a few answers to the question. First, we can't, um, under the Commerce Clause, we can't project our laws out into another state. Um, so we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't um, go after somebody uh, in another state for violating our law and try to get their activity, uh, what they did there, necessarily. It's not there that we're trying to regulate, though. We're regulating the initiation of a phone call to a person inside Vermont. And when they receive that call, if it's a violation of our law, we can enforce our law here against them. And that becomes, you know, so that's not a question of the, of the, the applicability of our law to our citizens and our consumer protection laws, which is definitely allowed in the police power. Uh, but the problem becomes, you know, is there sufficient context? Do we have personal jurisdiction over that person? It becomes a matter of civil procedure more than, than the consumer protection law and the substance of it. Um, so if we wanted to enforce this against somebody, you know, we'd have to try to haul them into Vermont and that would probably be hard. You know, a lot of these robocallers are in other countries and, um, you know, th that's the reality of it. 
Yeah, I'm just rolling this around in my head. I mean, I'd love to support this bill. I'd love it even better if we had any way of actually convicting or fining somebody. But the likelihood of that is pretty small. Um, I think everybody on the screen would love to have the political statement of saying, we try to do something, but I know at noontime, I'm gonna get a phone call and it's gonna begin with the words, hi, I'm Erica from such and such medical. And then all of a sudden it goes blank. They don't continue the call. And it's like clockwork. And if, it, if my phone rings this morning, I'm gonna pick it up and I'm gonna set it up to the screen because I, I know exactly what's going on. <laughs> Um, but I, I, at the end of the day, if we pass the bill and we all pat ourselves on the back for passing it and the robocalls continue, I think we're all still in trouble. Um, I don't know. I'm just rolling this all around in my head. There's a lot of law school questions, great bar exam questions on this subject. <clears throat> so, oh. Go ahead. Senator White. So I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, Senator Sears, but in terms of your uh, mass media robocall mm -hmm. that you were talking about, he probably wasn't even in violation because it only is it, um, effective if it's any one mass media activity totaling $500 or more. Oh, and he was. probably didn't spend $500 on that robocall to Bennington County. No, it wasn't a robocall. It was a mailing and and the totals oh. were more than $500, but because he paid three different vendors, the printer, the postage, and somebody else, he only counted each one separately. Oh, I thought you said it was a robocall. No, there were robocalls, too. There were so many robocalls that I can't imagine have been under $500. Okay. Oh, okay. Those robocalls are all that cheap. I didn't know they were that cheap. Anyway, um, but... I understand what you're saying, Joe, but um, I think it's important to put something on the books. It sends a message. I can at least say to somebody, you know what you're doing is against Vermont law. If I can speak to a human being, that's the other thing. <laughs> I don't know how to, to how to stop it when it's not a human being. There's, I mean, you're, you're talking to a <clears throat> an automated machine and I called one of them a bad name yesterday because it was an obvious scam. My wife had answered the phone. She was having a bad day. And then she yelled for me to come and answer the phone because it was so important. And by the way, it was a state of Vermont was the ID number. State of Vermont. Obviously it wasn't a state of Vermont. Hmm. Okay. Um, Charity Clark, from the, are there any other questions for David? Charity Clark from the Attorney General's office. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to see everyone. I'm sorry we're not in person. Here we are. I, know. Um, I am the Chief of Staff at the Attorney General's office. And um, as part of my role, I supervise the Consumer Assistance Program who receives uh, over 5,000 scam reports every year. Um, we don't actually track uh, or didn't track when that statistic um, was arrived at, which of those were robocalls. But anecdotally, most of them are robocalls. I, um, Senator Benning, I was thinking to myself when we started, I would be surprised if one of us does not receive a scam robocall by the time this hearing is over. If not us, then someone may be watching on the, on the live stream. Um, I, you know, we get them all day long. I've definitely been testifying already this year and been interrupted by a supposed call from Kane in Vermont, which is, you know, obviously going to be a scam robocall. Um, I don't know anyone in Canaan at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really a problem. And I am following along with interest with everything that David said, and also your questions. Um, it's frustrating because so far, I've, I think I've yet to, in my almost seven years at the Attorney General's office, um, uncovered a, a robocaller based in Vermont. And um, they're, they're based usually overseas. 
it's a problem that our fellow attorneys generals um, in, uh, in the other states are also aware of. And we have a working group through the National Association of Attorneys General um, on robocalls and trying to find solutions to this um, insidious problem. It's been very challenging. So let me let me start there. Um, I know this you, this committee is the same as the last time I testified on a very similar bill. So I don't have a lot of new information. This might be familiar. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, I wanted to remind you that I had a conversation, um, what I guess was it a year or was it two years ago um, on a similar bill. I had a conversation with the assistant attorney general in Indiana, who is the person who oversees their, their in, the Indiana has a ban on, on robocalls. And, and she said, well, I'm, you know, I'm glad we have this law, but it is challenging because um, scammers are already criminals. And so if you make robocalls a crime, it's just one more thing that they're, another cr crime that they're committing. They don't really respond, um, you know, as, as robustly as you might hope. So they felt like, she felt like it wasn't something that they really used that much, that law. It was um, a point of frustration for her as well. Um, so I just wanted to weigh in on that. That said, we support the bill. It's always good to try to, um, you know, have tools in your, your toolbox. Um, and uh, so I, you know, let me, let me say that. I, I do want to just emphasize that we, and I, I don't think that there's an expectation that the attorney general is going to be able to, you know, pursue some of these robocallers. Um, once this bill is, is passed, but I just want to emphasize we don't have an investigator designated to robocalls overseas or anything like that. There's a lot of, unfortunately, limitation to the to the enforcement abilities that we would have in, with this particular bill, just because so many of the perpetrators of robocall scams are overseas. It's just not feasible for us or practical. So I, I do want to um, you know, set that expectation. Um, the other thing that I wanted to note that um, the Federal Trade Commission webpage that David shared was really helpful. The FTC has great resources and I thought that was a really good overview. Um, we, I want to emphasize, of course, that you would always want to make sure that robocalls would be permitted for, you know, schools canceled, um, the political speech issue, and those were all really well laid out. So I won't go, go into those. Um, and uh, the private right of action is good to see. And I, I wanted to address the one big change was this uh, change in the criminal penalties. Um, I think I testified before the criminal penalties previously were very high and this is more right sized. So wanted to just say a word of support for that change um, with the smaller criminal penalties. Other than you know, just touching on those points and saying that we support the bill, I don't have um, too much else to say. I want to reassure you that our office um, is working on some creative solutions to robocalls, and um, we continue to try to mull over some options available to us. Um, it definitely is a big problem that just all day long at the consumer assistance program we hear about. So I, I'm, I'm here. I'm here and right with you, um, acknowledging that this is, is a problem. So happy to answer any questions. Questions for Charity? Um, I get, you know, I, every now and then I see some offer for something and I see it's not available in Vermont, California, like four or five other states. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what? Wouldn't this be helpful at least to have have it on the books that um, we have a state law against it? That's got. Um, I mean, I like I said, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to have the even tool though, toolbox. You know, uh, enforcement may be difficult, but. Well, it's also nice uh, we we can certainly envision um, something like this happening in Vermont, even just because it hasn't um, doesn't mean it, it couldn't, yeah. and it's nice I, to be ready. I mean, to, to the extent that we're all, we, we all laugh about, about this. I think Senator Baruth got a robocall in the middle of the last time we, I mean, it's funny. We, it's such a, it's such a pro, huge problem and widespread and so relatable to all of us because we all receive these right. robocalls and it's, they're literally a joke. And I, I think that that, that says a lot that we can all agree it's a problem to have the tool in the toolbox isn't a bad thing, especially um, as things develop, it's, it's nice to have, and, and we would support the bill. Thank you. 
I, I appreciate that. I, there is, you know, I wish somebody would invent a response. You know, we could have an automatic response on our phones to robocalls and we push nine or something like that. And it automatically says, well, there are I don't products. want your stupid robocall. You don't want to know what my husband says. I, well, there are uh, products available um, that, you know, we would never endorse one product or the other, but yeah. um, I, there, there are products available and um, the Department of Public Service, who knows all about, they're so informative um, on this topic, but they were explaining to me how, how these products work. And um, the, the miracle of, of the telephone, all of our federal laws were set up to make the call go through and how truly amazing that is. And especially when you think about uh, in rural Vermont, that still actually is a challenge to get the call through. And then we arrive at this point with robocalls where it's like, oh, oh, actually, no, not all the calls. We don't, we don't want all the calls to come through. Only right. this, the system, the, the infrastructure is set up to make that happen. So they created ways around this. The one that, that I think of is Nomo Robo. Um, that redirects the call to sort of a separate room. It's kind of a legal fiction, but they, they're still following the law. And then they have this list of scam phone numbers that they compare this call to, and it will, you know, keep the call from actually being, you know, officially delivered. So you don't see that, that you got, you got that call because it's a scam call. It's N-O-M-O. No mo robo. I can send um, Peggy the. That would be helpful. Our, we have yeah. a list of all of them on the CAPS webpage. Well, that'd be good. Senator can White. I ask a question about that. So I, um, the other day, got a call and on the ID thing, it said uh, it had the number and then it said Landmark College. Well, I often get a talk to the, the guy at Landmark College, and that's what it said. But it clearly wasn't at all when it turned out it wasn't them. So I don't want the number, I don't want the calls from Landmark College to be diverted. So how, how would that work with actually numbers that are legitimate and that you might be expecting a call from, but it ends up somebody else has, I don't understand. It's so then you're not getting it, it, even calls that you want to get. The spoofing call. I don't know how that would work. We'd have to ask DPS. Like, would that show? Would would Nomo Robo know? Oh, this is a spoofing call. It's actually this other number, and they're just showing you on your oh. ID. So they would know. Oh, this is a scam call. I, I'm not sure. I would. I would assume they would have figured that out. Um, and I should note because I also um, know a lot about data privacy that there are products that Nomo Robo is cost money every month, and there are products you can get on your phone that are free. But of course, those products are collecting your data, and that's how they make money. That's yep. what DPS explained to me. Um, they were telling me different products. They're, they, it's fascinating to hear them talk about this topic, FYI. But um, no more, more robots. Well, that the, the one that we have said? actually we have in our next hour um, after the break. We have somebody from the. Um, uh, we have actually Charity Clark, uh, Clay Purvis from. <laughs> the telecommunications and connectivity department. I think Chris Curtis, our chief of, of public protection will probably be there in my stead. Oh, okay. Ask Clay but, about, about this. If well, I think we can ask Clay about robocalls. Um, if Peggy could alert him um, to, if he could speak a little of that, about that when he testifies on data plans, data usage plans um, at 10.15. Will do. Um, other questions for Charity? So yeah, it would be helpful to have that link um, and maybe get the word out to um, legislators. I haven't looked at it in a while. So when I, when I send it to Peggy, I'm going to say this might be a little dusty. Let me have the Consumer Assistance Program take another look and make sure there, there aren't updates that we should include. But I'll send it today so that you'll at least have that. Great. Thank you. Um, this is one time we probably ought to change the rule about signs in the Senate chamber. Since we won't really be in the Senate chamber, we could hold up a sign and whoever reports this bill with directions on how to do that. Okay. Thank you very much, Charity. Appreciate it. Sorry, we're not going to see you a little later. 
Um, but we look forward to Chris Curtis. Haven't seen him in a while. Uh, Chris Delia, speaking of Chris Curtis. You're muted, Chris. Yes. Love the dreaded, forget to take yourself off mute. Um, so good morning, Senator. Good morning, committee. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this morning for the record. Chris Delia, president of the Vermont Bankers Association. Um, I want to share with you this morning the fact that um, we support what you're trying to do here in stopping robocalls. Um, I haven't talked to a banker yet that hasn't been frustrated by the calls from Canaan or other locations that are rerouting numbers and calls to Vermonters. Uh, it's very frustrating for all of us, especially when they're trying to sell me a warranty on a vehicle that I don't even own, you get those <laughs> calls as well. Yeah. I think what, uh, what concerns us with the bill is just the, the wording, if you will, in some instances, or maybe I should say the lack of wording in some instances, when you have broad definitions or, or statements like automatic telephone dialing systems and so on, which certainly are defined at the federal level, but I'm not aware of definitions in Vermont statute. So what we'd like to try and focus on is whether it's possible to be a little bit more clear in what we're trying to accomplish, um, especially by defining what a robocall is, which again, I'm not aware that it's defined in Vermont statute. Also focusing on how this applies because as we've just learned, we're all used to getting the phone calls from the school districts or the pharmacies or the doctor's office. Um, those often imply an existing relationship between the individual receiving the call and the entity making the call. In our case, that would be a business relationship. And I'll say that for the banking industry, there is not a uniform adaption of technology. There are some banks who utilize a variation of robocall, and then there are banks who do not use this technology at all. And for those who use it, the, the general concern is the unintended consequence. They just don't want to get wrapped up into something that is not clear, uh, it is not uh, all knowing to the reader, if you will, of the Vermont statute. So I'm, I'm thankful that Dave put up some of those examples because that in my mind is an opportunity to offer clarity. So for example, uh, in the time of COVID, I've had a couple of institutions that have used a automated calling system to let folks know that there has been a change of hours at branching operations because of the pandemic. Um, that is going to the customer of that institution. So there is that business relationship. Again, I mentioned, and in, in as David saw in that FTC uh, document, you've got schools that are using the technology. You've got uh, utilities that use the technology. We had consolidated communications do some work on our phone line. We got an automated call after the work was done, letting us know that they had concluded the work and what the outcome was. We've just talked about doctor's offices, pharmacies, we even have the attorney general's office that uses robocalls in their alert system when they're trying to make Vermonters aware of scams that are out there. Um, so it's another, uh, it's another tool that can be used. Uh, a couple of my banks were thinking, uh, have been thinking, unfortunately, along the lines of the Department of Labor's recent data breach, information breach, that may be an automated system could be utilized to inform their customers in the event that the institution were to experience a breach or uh, in the event that something uh, on a wide scale, we heard comments yesterday about Equifax was happening that they could also alert their customers to something like that. I had others who said, you know, we could envision utilizing this technology 
to flag for our customers suspicious activity that's going out there, uh, that's going on out there in the marketplace. So, you know, think of elder fraud scams or other scams that are happening uh, all too often in Vermont. So could you utilize this technology to uh, provide that uh, information to the consumers? And then we have situations going on today where a number of our banks actually have call centers where if I have a problem with my account, I could call that call center, they could work on it, and they use an automatic system to call me back to let me know that the issue has been resolved. And then finally, the, the uh, area that um, is most recent for a couple of our institutions, and that is the issue of spoofing. And Senator Sears, this was in your neck of the woods. We had it in Senator Nick's neck of the woods, unfortunately. And that's where somehow the bad actors, the criminals, got a hold of a bank's phone number and they started to make phone calls to all of the bank's customers. And the premise in one instance was, um, we've detected some fraudulent activity on your account and they led the customer to, uh, to try and get account information or personal identifying information. Unfortunately, the, the customer getting the call thinks it's a legitimate call. Uh, and we know of a couple of instances where they've actually given that information up. Um, on those occasions, the customers were made whole, the bank ended up eating the losses. But spoofing of a legitimate business's number is a very real issue. So all of those relate to unintended consequences that we don't wanna have occur um, with any piece of legislation here in Vermont. So is it possible to uh, narrow the scope of the bill or clearly define what is allowable under the bill as was just outlined by the FTC document that David showed you? Because again, many people are not going to be looking at the federal statutes. They're not going to be perhaps even aware that the federal statutes exist. And then the other thing in, in looking at the penalty section, um, just trying to do some quick research, it seems like the, uh, the Vermont penalty and the federal law penalty may not be aligned. I could be wrong in that. I didn't see any jail time in the federal penalty, which seems to be uh, something that was not included in the previous iteration of the bill. And honestly, I haven't seen it in a lot of like type consumer bills that uh, I've seen over the last few years that the legislature has worked on. So I thought that was a bit unusual. You know, bottom line, we want to, um, we want to be supportive of trying to stop the robocalls that are going on I think it is unfortunate that there's no real enforcement mechanism because of the way, where these originate, if you will. So uh, I understand, Senator, your desire to have something on the books, as Charity Clark said, it probably won't get utilized very much because of the nature of these criminals. But those are some of the areas we wanted to just flag for you and see if you're willing to work on some additional language, perhaps just to tighten it up a bit. Questions, Senator White. Oh, I just wondered, listening to Chris here, if this would have, and it wouldn't be applicable now, but um, when we had Vermont Yankee here, we had a system set up that if there was some kind of a, um, an incident at Vermont Yankee, it would send out a call to everybody in the surrounding um, towns within a certain mile range. And I, I wondered if that would have been affected here then in the same way that you're talking about. It, it possibly could. I mean, it falls into that category of information, I think. But again, oh. looking at the looking at the bill, um, unlike the, the FTC document that David showed you, um, the bill doesn't tell you what's allowable, 
I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and whether it's that existing business relationship or informational or healthcare related. So that's where it's a bit open-ended in our opinion. And, and again, if you're willing to offer or allow us to work on some language that would tighten it up just so that, you know, the parties looking at the statute are pretty clear on what you can do. And, and if you're outside of that scope, what's not allowable, we just, we don't want to get caught um, by trying to serve our customers and utilize uh, allowable technology, but you know it, it would fall under whatever the definition is of the robocall. Well, um, yet we have that business relationship with the customer. Or again, I'll go back to the spoofing, which is, has been the problem for two of my institutions just within the last three months. What, what would happen if, if we were to and David, maybe you can answer this. If we were to take the federal exemptions and add them to this bill so that we're exempting whatever is exempted by the feds, which would cover Chris's concern, I would think. But um, would that be a problematic? Uh, it's going to be a longer bill. <laughs> I, I well, think that the reason, I mean, I'm pulling back now to- Or you uh, could reference, I mean, you could you could reference that. If you wanted to shorten the bill, you could reference the- I, I'm not at all concerned about the length. Uh, I, that was just a joke. I, I, the, the, the reason I'm, I'm pulling back now to my original conversations with you and Senator Brock um, and sort of trying to figure out uh, you know, the best way to achieve alignment substantively yeah. between what's permitted mm-hmm. in the state and at the federal level. I mean, the, I think the, I, I think the preference was to, for the, the, there to be uniformity. And um, so the, the reason that it is written the way that it is in, the, in addition for it being a little bit simpler, uh, is that um, there is a lot of discretion vested in several different federal agencies to adopt rules and issue orders around this subject. And what is uh, permissible at the federal level, you know, it, is changing from time to time with a different with different rules. And um, <clears throat> We, you know, as I mentioned, there was uh, a Supreme Court case that resolved last year that struck down part of the federal law. Um, and I, I guess the, the, the risk to trying to put into Vermont statute now all of the stuff that is in the federal statutes and regulations now is that that, that freezes the Vermont law at a place in time and as, if the federal law changes, um, then we could have potentially a different scheme. And, you know, with respect to a, a bank or a business or emergency call or Vermont Yankee, whatever, um, you know, th- those federal laws already apply to everybody. So if, you know, you're going to try to issue robocalls, then you, you know, you, you need to know what the federal law provides, what's allowed and not allowed under the federal law. And um, regardless of what the state law says, that, you know, there's a compliance issue there. So by mirroring the federal law and the state law, you have automatic compliance with the state law as far as long as you're following the federal law. So that's the only risk I see with, with fleshing it out more is the divergence of the federal and state standards over time. But you know, that that that's a that's a risk states take all the time when they try to have a sort of a dual regulatory framework. So it's a, it's just a policy choice for you guys, however you want to construct it. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, is there an interest in making sure that the 
exemptions that Chris noted will be um, part of the bill. Sound, re sound reasonable. Uh, if I have a relationship with the um, institution or company or whatever it is, it's a little different than the warranty call. I keep telling you it's my, it's my last chance and they never stop. Charity was able to share with Peggy the um, the directions to blocking robocalls. So that is now posted on our website and um, we should. Uh, is it easier, is it easier, Dick, to simply reference the federal exemptions if uh, I yeah. heard Chris say that his businesses usually know what those federal exemptions are so that we don't have to keep changing the bill if the federal uh, government changes its bill. Right. And, and I don't know if there's anything you can do uh, to address the unintended consequences of spoofing because that's that's something that we'll find out about when we've got customers who are calling and complaining that the bank is calling them and, and that I wanna try and eliminate any uh, of that risk for somebody who's been taken advantage of, if possible. If I may, Mr. Chair, um, you, you folks actually, um, did a, a similar thing a few years ago in adopting or clarifying for the purposes of state statute that spoofing is illegal to basically to the extent uh, of the federal law. Um, it's so as a matter of federal and state law, it is illegal to spoof and um, it, it, it there's some nuance and there's some circuit cases working their way up because sometimes people use spoofing uh, for legitimate reasons. To, for instance, if they're trying to mask um, their their number because they're doing market research and they they don't want to. So there's been some court cases on businesses that do that. But for the by and large, for purposes of of federal and state law, as of two or three years ago, it's you you are required is a matter of Vermont law to provide accurate caller ID information with very few exceptions. And it's it's kind of the same spot we're in with robocalls. Um, I mean, we're, you know, we're trying to make it more illegal than it is. What we really need is better enforcement. And that's, that's really what the TRACED Act is intended to do and uh, is to try to get better enforcement, but it is an imperfect system as well. Okay. Thank you. I think that would be a good idea to add to the bill. So I think there will be time next Thursday to take this bill up again and, and see a redraft, if that's okay, David, uh, with you and Peggy. Um, I don't think we're going to spend that much time on S45, the probation bill. So I think we would have time. To do so. um, we're finished earlier than I anticipated. Peggy, if we were to take a break until nine, I mean, it already is now, until 10 and then see if the witnesses are available to come back to for the for us um, for the uh, discussion about internet charges for for going over data planning if they would be available to start at 10 yep i can email them and ask them to start at 10 right. anything else committee before we move on here and we're going to stop the live stream Okay. Thank you.
see you at 10. <laughs>